In the middle of the 19th century, the Mormon pioneers came to an empty valley in the western mountains and there built for themselves and their children a city. They built it from bricks that they made with their own hands from the mud of the valley floor or from stones carved one by one from the granite mountains. Plank by plank, they built it in a valley barren of trees. They brought the logs from the mountain forests until they had erected a city that would house themselves and their children, their dreams and their prayers. This is the story of the early buildings of Salt Lake City and the men and women who built them and used them. This was to be no boom town today, ghost town tomorrow. These people planned to stay here, to send their roots down deep. The first week, Brigham Young picked out the spot for the new temple to be built. That same week, even before they began to build homes, a group of Mormon battalion men erected a temporary outdoor shelter for their Sabbath meetings. They called it the Bowery. Two years later, a larger Bowery was built again on the temple block. 100 posts supported a dirt roof, and the Bowery seated 3,000 people who came here for church services, plays, and musicals. In fine weather, of course. <laughs> Only in fine weather. And with all those posts, quite a few of the 3,000 were always craning their necks to see around them. Clearly, there was room for improvement. The improvement came in the form of the old tabernacle, which was new then, of course. It was designed using wooden arches to support the roof with no columns in the interior. At that time, it was the only auditorium in the American frontier. With the scarcity of tools and materials on the frontier, it was a hard place to build such a building. Nails had to be hammered individually out of scrap iron. Brigham Young writes about personally going about looking for nails. He finally got seven pounds from A. Farnham. In 1852, when it was finished, the auditorium seated 3,000 people, but already it was not large enough. So two years later, in April of 1854, the congregation met outside again and by October they had built the third Bowery. It was from the third Bowery that Daniel H. Wells announced a plan to build an auditorium that would seat 10,000. In the middle of the 19th century, that would have been an awesome undertaking anywhere in the world. But here, hundreds of miles away from a railroad, it was even more audacious. The pioneers must build their tabernacle from the timber, rock, and rawhide of their desert home. Henry Grow designed the roof using the lattice arch principle. The Jordan River Bridge west of the city served as a prototype for the lattice construction. Brigham Young wanted to make sure of a rounded roof. He was interested in a self-supporting structure with no poles, and he felt the rounded ceiling would ensure good acoustics. The work progressed from 1863 to 1867 with 150 to 200 men working daily on the building. Iron and steel were so scarce that wooden pegs served as nails in the roof, and the timbers were tied with green rawhide to reinforce the cracked or weak spots. This bound them steel tight. When the scaffolding was ready to come down, some feared the roof would fall in, but Henry Grow had designed it well. October 3, 1867, they took the scaffolding down without accident, it is recorded. The first conference was held in the tabernacle that same October. It was a thrilling occasion. The tabernacle was magnificent. There were no poles to obstruct the view, and the meeting was protected from the weather. There were still problems, however. To Brigham Young's dismay, the acoustics were not very good, and 10,000 seats were not enough. People still had to stand in the aisles and doorways. The addition of a gallery helped solve both problems. It added 3,000 seats and improved the acoustics. Over the years, the Tabernacle has hosted a wide variety of events. I am thankful to my Heavenly Father for the privilege of meeting you again. And I'm happy to say that I am well satisfied. As citizens of the United States, we have an awesome responsibility. Music has always had a revered place in the church. An organ must be provided for the new tabernacle. 
Joseph H. Ridges designed and built the original organ. Truman O. Angel, the architect who designed the building, wrote in his personal journal, we built that organ from native lumber, with native labor, with homemade nails and glue, and rawhide from the pelts of Utah cattle and calves. Even at that, Brother Ridges had to go to Boston for some parts. In 1870, with its 2,638 pipes, it was truly a miracle in the desert. Today, with its more than 10,000 pipes, the tabernacle organ is one of the world's great instruments. Today's tabernacle choir and organ are famous worldwide. They broadcast a program weekly from Temple Square, the oldest continuous radio program in the United States, now on television also. The planning and use of the first permanent building in the valley illustrates the compounding of priorities and interests of the saints. The building was the old council house, a simple building of red sandstone, 45 feet square. It was completed just three and a half years after the first pioneers came to the west. It served as a temporary temple. Over 2,000 endowments were given here. It was a provisional state house of the state of Deseret. It housed the territorial legislature, the University of Deseret, and a public library. And several magazines and newspapers were published here. Other buildings came along quickly to serve the multiplicity of needs of these remarkable people. The endowment house was built in the northwest corner of Temple Square. True to its name, it served as an interim temple for 43 years. The saints had come west to build a temple and worship God. While the saints were still meeting in the old bowery, their leaders asked them to pledge their means and support to the building of a temple. Two years later, they broke ground and began the gigantic task that would take 40 years to complete. Brigham Young said of the temple, I scarcely ever say much about revelations or visions, but suffice it to say, five years ago last July, I was here and saw in spirit the temple. Not 10 feet from where we have laid the chief cornerstone. I have not inquired what kind of temple we should build. Why? Because it was represented before me. I have never looked upon that ground, but the vision of it was there. I see it plainly as if it was in reality before me. Wait until it is done. It will have six towers. Brigham's vision was 40 years in the realization, 40 years of arduous labor and sacrifice. Granite blocks, some of them weighing five tons, had to be moved from the mountain quarry by ox team. Construction stopped when Johnson's army came through, but the saints did not give up. And when the army left, the pioneers went back to building their temple. Work was slowed by a grasshopper plague and a severe winter that killed half the cattle. In 1873, 20 years after the groundbreaking, the railroad came and construction went forward much faster. They built a spur which went right into the temple block. On April 6, 1892, they laid the capstone. And the following year, the temple was dedicated by President Wilfred Woodruff. 82,000 saints attended 32 sessions of the dedication to present the completed temple to their God. It had taken 40 years to complete the building, but the saints had not neglected their temple worship during that time. They had come to the valley to worship and make covenants with the Lord, and they did it in some of their earliest buildings. In 1849, the church in the valley was organized into 19 wards. The wards built their own chapels, and this, the 14th Ward Chapel, was typical, serving as meeting house for the ward on Sundays, and on weekdays doubling as schoolhouse, public building, and social hall. By 1853, the saints had built themselves a real social hall. It took nine months to build, and the new Deseret Dramatic Association spent those nine months preparing a winter season of 15 plays. They had three different theater seasons that year. The social hall was also the scene of many a ball and a banquet. 
the menu was at times lavish, not typical of the western frontier. Many sessions of the territorial legislature were held there. It was also a library, MIA gym, and training school for the theater arts. The social hall served the saints for 70 years, but it could not take care of the growing number of saints. In 1861, the Salt Lake Theater was dedicated. It seated 3,000 people and became famous for its fine facilities and the great artists who performed there. Among the performers who appeared there was Utah's own Maude Adams. For all the fineness of the building and the performances, the Salt Lake Theater was in the wilderness, and the box office took payment in kind. One man wrote that he took a large turkey to pay for his admission. He received change in the form of two spring chickens. William Hepworth, an English visitor, wrote, The Playhouse has an office and service higher in this Mormon city than the churches would allow to it in London, Paris, or New York. Brigham Young felt that the theater could portray good and evil and the triumph of good. He felt that the actors should be just as virtuous, truthful, and humble before God and each other as though they were on a mission. In order to meet the many building demands and furnish jobs for new immigrants, the church organized the public works. Public works built the six miles of the old city wall and the Temple Square wall. The wall around Temple Square is older than any of the buildings inside it. Public Works also built many of the public buildings and mills and shops in Salt Lake City. ZCMI, Zion's Cooperative Mercantile Institution, was another part of the economic program. The first department store west of the Mississippi. It was started to keep the prices down on hard-to-get merchandise and to protect the people from being exploited by unscrupulous merchants. Cooperative retail stores were planned in every community to stock dry goods, groceries, hardware, and farm tools. The Saints were a religious people, even in their economic life. So the old tithing house on the corner of Main and South Temple occupied an important place in their lives. Money was scarce and the goods valuable. Most tithing was paid in kind. So the tithing house hosted a collection of livestock as well as stocks of grain handwork, and other commodities. The second floor was called the Hall of the Lord's Storehouse. Brigham Young regarded dancing as good exercise, so they held dances and socials there. Mr. Moburn, a visiting news correspondent, attended such a dance. He reported, The Mormon people display great taste and exquisite enjoyment in a ballroom. Here might be seen the aged father and the mature matron, the sprightly youth and the lovely daughter mingling together in their liveliest realms, which gave me a degree of pleasure I scarcely ever experienced. If the public buildings of early Salt Lake City illustrate the diversity and taste of the saints' life, their private homes serve to emphasize it. Some were simple homes to accommodate the large families and the many activities. Others were large, built by the more wealthy to express their love of beauty and their taste in architecture, to symbolize the depth of the roots they were putting down in the desert wilderness. Brigham Young's home, the Lion House, is an example of the sense of beauty and purpose they incorporated into their homes. His New England heritage influenced him to choose simple lines. The interior of the house was appointed to serve his large family in every way kitchen and dining room, food pantries and cellars, a parlor or prayer room where the family gathered morning and evening for devotional services, 20 bedrooms, a gymnasium and a schoolroom. Church offices were in an annex between the Lion House and the Beehive House, which was Brigham Young's official residence as president of the church. It also served as the executive mansion when he was the governor of the territory. The church historian kept the church records in his own home. As time went on and the need grew, Brigham Young's children graduated from the basement schoolroom to a schoolhouse. One of Brigham Young's daughters wrote, We sat on benches or wooden chairs with desks in front. Both benches and desks exactly fitted our backs and legs so that we suffered no discomfort. Between 1847 and 1851, communications to and from the valley were by wagon train. Even later, when the mail delivery arrived daily, the mail was two months old. 
October 18, 1861, the telegraph came to Utah, thus ending the isolation. As the city grew, the horizons and hopes of the saints expanded. In its public spirit, the citizens erected an architecture elaborate city hall and the Eagle Gate on the Brigham Young Estate, erected over the original gateway which led to City Creek Canyon. The Eagle Gate became a notable and controversial landmark. The Englishman, Sir Richard Burton, described it in his way. A huge vulturing eagle, perched with wings outspread, neck bended and talons clinging upon a yellow beehive. Clarissa Young said of it, there was a legend in the old days that every time the noon whistle blew, he would leave his perch, fly straight down State Street to the old wooden water trough, get a drink of water, and fly back again. I sat many a time waiting for that bird to fly, but apparently I was always called away to dinner at the wrong time, for I never had the pleasure of seeing him in action. Thus the city grew, not springing up in the desert, but pulled and wrenched up by a firm, dedicated, diversified people who were not willing merely to subsist and wait until the fine things of life came to them, but were determined to provide them for themselves. Isolated from the outside world, relying on their own diligence and strength, using the materials of their new valley home and their own strength and faith in God, they built a city diversified and purposeful, uniquely suited to their own desires and goals. A city testifying in wood and stone of their faith, their diligence, and dedication.